you know, our, being that we live in a Christian nation, we, we usually assume that Christianity is the faith that resembles Judaism the most, where, where in, in some ways that might not necessarily be so. Um, in some ways, Islam um, resembles Judaism much more than Christianity in certain ways. Uh, they have an oral tradition. They have discussion of Islamic law, details and, and, and specifics, and some of their laws are even similar to, to our laws. We know where they got them from, but that the, the point is that, that the, the whole system of the construct of their religion and how they assess things uh, resembles uh, the way that Jews assess things as well. The great names, the pillars of their faith, the, the, uh, the, the heroes of their religion are people that we all know, uh, we know uh, very well. In, in the Quran, you'll find Adam, you'll find Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Lot, um, Joseph, Saul, David, Solomon, Elijah, Job, Jonah, and Moses. You find them all. Okay? They're all mentioned in the Quran, as are the stories of the fall of uh, Adam and the, uh, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the Quran's account of creation, life in paradise, the question of what came first, heaven or earth, the objection of the angels in the creation of Adam, uh, Adam's remarkable wisdom, Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam's universal lesson of repentance, all are clearly culled from Torah and our Midrashim. Likewise, all the stories about Israel's covenant with God and the travails in Egypt and the miracles of the Red Sea and the making of the golden calf and the pillar of the cloud and the manna and the quails and Moses hitting the rock and the objection to the taste of manna and the giving of the Torah by raising a mountain over the Jews' heads and the red heifer are all obvious adaptations from the entire spectrum of Jewish tradition. Yet they claim that we, we took it from them, obviously. 1,500 years later. You have to do some pretty creative mental gymnastics to, to claim that we copied you 1,500 years after all of it, whatever. So these five pillars that we discussed make up Islam for between 80 and 85% of worldwide Muslims. They're, called, they're named Sunni Muslims. After Muhammad passed away, so there was a dispute exactly as how to proceed as far as leadership. So the dispute be mainly began as a, more of like a political dispute, how to proceed politically, who should be the leaders and whatnot. But as time progressed, these political differences took on also theological differences as well. So 15 to 20 percent of uh, the Muslim population in the world are Shia Muslims who add three more principles to their faith, one of which is jihad. Now, we're not going to discuss this as a, as a, as a main topic, just, just to mention sort of peripherally that jihad, even the way that it's depicted today on the news and, and by certain groups, is not, even that is not the, the uh, primary way that jihad has been assessed and done uh, in, in, the, in the mind of, of Muslims uh, for, for the past centuries. There are officially laws and, and practices that go into making an official jihad. It's not just, oh, we, we don't like these people, let's start uh, randomly killing people. Even in those, who, even in those Muslims who believe in jihad, and, and, and uh, there, there are certain uh, parameters officially as part of their faith that are meant to be um, locked into place before uh, jihad can be done. So, w not to justify any of it, but just... But, but perhaps some of the things that we see on the news is, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a fringe element, unfortunately, that has uh, really um, given a bad name to the entire Islamic faith. How does Jewish law view Islamic, and we'll mention also, just because we're talking about it, how does it, how does it Jew view um, the Islamic faith and the Christian faith? I was talking about it anyway. So the first thing that we have to know is that Judaism abhors idolatry and paganism. You know, before 2,000 years ago, before the onset of Christianity, you had the worst of the worst scenarios in people's beliefs. People believed in all sorts of gods, but uh, com uh, accompanying that, accompanying the 
the, the belief in multiple gods, was a whole culture dedicated to the worst things that this planet has ever seen. Killing, immorality, sac human sacrifices, crazy, crazy things. It was a crazy, crazy world. You have to be suspect of so many different things that, thank God, in our world, in, in, in modern times and in modern countries, that we don't have to be as concerned about. So Judaism abhors idolatry and paganism because of all, just aside from the fact that it's worshiping the wrong God, just because complete with that, that culture comes all sorts of terrible practices as part of the mainstream focus of their faith. So, in fact, Judaism abhors idolatry so much that it's one of the three things that if a Jew is presented, it, we have to give up our life for it. In other words, for a Jew, if somebody puts a gun to your head and says, violate the Sabbath, we're technically allowed to do that because you save a life, you save your life. If, if, if somebody's presented a gun to their head, eat a cheeseburger. It's not kosher. You're allowed to do it because you save your life. But if somebody says, if someone holds the gun to a Jew's head and says, worship an idol, bow down to this idol, the Jew's supposed to let his life be taken, bite the bullet. So that's how much idolatry is abhorred. It, it completely contradicts everything that a Jew stands for. In fact, the Talmud dedicates an entire volume to how we deal with idols and idol worshippers. So where does Islam fall in that category? How did the sages view that faith? So this dilemma, this idea, was, was discussed by Maimonides, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage, and he, was, he, he talks about it in his responsa literature. And it's in response to a person named Ovadia. Ovadia was a, a, a Muslim who had converted to Judaism. And when he was learning uh, in the yeshiva environment, he was learning from a rabbi, and the rabbi was giving him a hard time about his past, saying that Muslims were idol worshippers and sort of making fun of him for his, for his past. And so Ovadia corresponds with the Rambam. It says, is that really my past? Should, the, is, is, should I feel guilty about that? Or am I an idol worshiper? And so the Rambam writes back very clearly that Islam is not considered idolatry. Here's what he says. He says, the Ishmaelites, Muslims, are not idol worshippers at all. All idolatry has ceased to exist from their mouths and hearts, and they attribute the proper oneness to God with no blemish. And if someone will say, that the house that they worship in is an idolatrous shrine, the Kaaba in, in Saudi Arabia, which before the onset of Islam was used in, in uh, pagan worship. If someone will say that those who pray there are worshiping in an idolatrous shrine as their ancestors worshipped idols there, this does not matter because those who go there today and bow there today have their hearts dedicated to heaven towards God. And the Ishmaelites today, all of them, men, women, and children, have ceased to believe in idolatry. There are mistakes in other things. However, in attributing oneness to God, they have no mistake at all. Full-on monotheism. So Islam seemed to have a, a very special, uh, a unique standing in Jewish tradition as far as from a theological point of view. We could talk for a second, you know, how would that apply to walking into a mosque, going into a mosque? Our Mishnah in Judaism, the Mishnah teaches that a Jew is forbidden from entering a place where worship is theologically contrary to Judaism. So how would that go with, with Islam? So some rabbis, some sages hold that even though Islam is not an idolatrous religion, it's still forbidden to enter a mosque because it's a place where Muslims invoke and glorify the name of Muhammad and read publicly from portions of the Quran, which suggests that the Torah is not true. Um, so according to those authorities, according to those sages, one would not be able to enter into a mosque. However, the vast majority of sages have determined that mosques are not problematic to enter from a theological, uh, for theological reasons. And this is dealt with actually extensively in the responsa literature of Rabbi Avadi Yosef, former chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel. In fact, in the 19th century, Rabbi Yitzchak, Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, who was a respected sage at the time, was posed a question by a certain group of Jewish soldiers that had fought in Russia against the Turks. So after they conquered an important city, the Jewish soldiers 
asked if they could have a place where they could pray. And the authorities gave them a mosque to use. And they, they asked Rabbi Spector, is it appropriate that we, that, we can use this as a, that we can use this as a synagogue? It's a mosque, after all. And so he responded once again, Muslims are not idol worshippers. It's clear and simple that one could make a permanent synagogue out of a mosque that was given to you by the authorities. In this regard, Christianity would be a bit more problematic, at least according to the, the Rambam's perspective. Because, again, there's many different sects of Christianity, and so it's difficult to make sweeping statements. But the doctrine of the Trinity is much more theologically problematic for a Jew, and therefore a Jew entering a church would be more restrictive than a Jew entering a mosque. Again, as far as practical application of all this and how and when and how and why to use it, um, it's consult your local rabbi. But as far as just uh, in, in theoretical terms, it would be, uh, in theory, more problematic.